Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Wall. Um, and you're right, we've known each other for a long time. Um, but I sort of feel like a fraud because I know half the people in the room. And <laughs> <laughs> I've had all sorts of drinks with them in different parts of the world. And so I, um, I'm happy to be here. And I'm glad that this is uh, an opportunity for us to really have a conversation about this. I'm sure that you have um, ideas and thoughts and insights uh, that I would be welcome uh, to hear, and I had lunch with your, your doctoral students this afternoon, which was really a great uh, opportunity for me. Uh, I tried to kidnap Andre, but then it didn't work. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, they asked me a really wonderful question, uh, you know, who do you learn from? And I, and I said that there are two people here for certain uh, younger scholars, not the established uh, people like uh, Professor Godziba. Uh, <laughs> But, but I really learned a lot from uh, both Vincent Lloyd and Katie Grimes, and so I really, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm sorry Katie's not here, and I know why, but, but I, I'm glad Vincent is, and so you get some pushback, uh, and I think we'll have a chance to really talk to each other. <clears throat> a few weeks ago, uh, I was invited uh, by one of our undergraduates, Anthony Smith, to speak at Boston College's annual student-run commemoration of the life and work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. In preparation for this occasion, I asked Mr. Smith, a co-chair of the event and coincidentally a participant in the seminar I'm teaching on gender and slavery, what should I speak about? The theme of the event, he told me, was reimagining black liberation. And what does that mean, I asked. And so Mr. Smith replied, the person who should be at the center of reimagining black liberation today, in fact, he said, reimagining liberation and flourishing for all people is a black, differently abled, queer, trans woman. I was really both surprised and quite gratified because such a person is positioned quite marginally to the lives that most students at Boston College live, and I suspect to the lives lived by students here at Villanova. To place a black, differently abled, queer trans woman at the center of your imagination calls for encountering, grasping, and judging reality from quite a different angle, it requires shifting into a different perspective, the perspective of an other human person. So this afternoon, I want to, uh, maybe we can bring this uh, black, brown, red, yellow, differently abled queer trans woman, because this is about women of color, although that'll be probably a question we can talk more about. But to bring that, that person to the center of our thinking and imagining, to position this, these women at the center of Catholic social teaching. So <clears throat> I have three parts. The first is a kind of sketch of Catholic social teaching, but probably no one in here really needs this. Uh, but you never know, and so just for the sake of those few undergrads who were ordered to be here, uh, um, I'll just give a, a quick definition and some principal themes and capacities for contribution. Second, um, a treatment of racism with a treatment of racism. And then third, some thoughts on imagination, on imagination. So Catholic social teaching. The phrase Catholic social teaching refers to, I'm quoting here from Dan Grudy, all the principles, concepts, ideas, theories, and doctrines that deal with human life and society as it has evolved over time since the days of the early church. Catholic social teaching, he writes, seeks to challenge those dimensions of society that diminish people's relationships with God, with others, with the environment, and with themselves, and to promote those factors that enhance these relationships. Catholic social teaching <clears throat> is neither merely didactic 
nor is it an unchanging doctrinaire body of teaching. Rather, it retains a measure of creative open-endedness in both its articulation of principles for social living and in the way those basic principles are applied. Four chief sources, or as most Catholic ethicists like to say, fonts of insight or wisdom contributing, uh, contribute to the development of Catholic social teaching, revelation, reason, tradition, and human experience. At the same time, Catholic social teaching draws concepts and ideas and theories um, from theology, philosophy, economics, sociology, and other social sciences to gain a more comprehensive and thorough understanding of the challenges that confront our world. We commonly encounter Catholic social teaching through its documentary heritage. The phrase is really belong, that phrase belongs to Tom Massaro in his little living justice. Those are the papal documents and encyclicals dating from Pope Leo XIII's Rerum Novarum on the condition of labor in 1891 up to uh, Pope Fran I almost said St. Francis, but <laughs> Pope Francis's uh, Laudato Si, our common home in 2015. These documents, these encyclicals, address an array of social concerns, including technological development and massive poverty, the threat of war and the use of nuclear weapons, euthanasia, abortion, political turmoil and struggles for independence, atheism, communism, hedonism, secularism, indifference, complacent consumerism and acquisitive individual materialism the hegemony of transnational corporations, and so on. Catholic social teaching consistently critiques our modern social and political policies and programs from both the so-called left and the so-called right. Catholic social teaching, in some ways, tries to seek, a third or, to seek a third or middle way, holding in tension concerns for human liberty, the primacy of conscience, regard for human agency, private property and subsidiarity, all those on the one hand with concern for the common good or the social whole, including the good of human persons who are most marginalized, most vulnerable, and most culturally and economically impoverished. There are, as you know, seven key themes of Catholic social teaching, the sanctity of human life, the dignity of the person, the call to family, community, and participation in pursuit and construction of the common human good, rights and responsibilities with regard to social justice, including uh, distribution, the dignity of work, solidarity and the universal destiny of the goods of the earth, the preferential option for the poor and the vulnerable, and care for God's creation. <clears throat> So racism and uh, women of color. So what is racism? First and foremost, I understand racism as a complex structural or systemic phenomenon. James Boggs, a Detroiter like me, a lifelong factory worker and iconoclastic organic intellectual gives I think a very good and comprehensive definition of structural or systemic racism. Racism, he writes, is systematized oppression of one race of another. In other words, the various forms of oppression within every sphere of social relations, economic exploitation, military subjugation, political subordination, cultural devaluation, psychological violation, sexual degradation, verbal abuse, etc., together make up a whole of interacting and developing processes which operate so normally and naturally and are so much a part of the existing institutions of society that the individuals involved are barely conscious of their operation. Ordinarily, we tend to think of racism uh, or, re or reduce it really to individual acts, to acts of malice or hatred committed by bad or rogue individuals. When we do so, 
we obscure the larger and deeper dynamics of the ways race and racism forms us as individuals, has formed us as a national community, and has formed us even as a church. Racism does not rely on the choices or actions of a few white individuals. Rather, it is structured or institutionalized. And thus, racism goes well beyond individual prejudice or even bigotry and ties attitudes or feelings of superiority to putatively legitimate and commonly sanctioned exercises of power. There are so many repugnant aspects of racism, but none more daunting, more infuriating, and more dispiriting than its ordinariness, wearying. In certainly our country, but not our country or this country specifically or exclusively, living flesh and blood, children, women, and men live out their daily lives within a context structured by racism. The most mundane activities, grocery shopping, banking, registering for school, inquiring about church membership, using public transportation. These ordinary activities are too often shot through with negative charges. This ordinariness twists and distorts the very meaning of generous and compassionate human living. What we need to really understand is that racism is not a problem out there to be solved. It has become a way in which we define our reality, live our most intimate moments. Racism is not something already out there now for us to solve or fix. Rather, it is in us, sedimented in our consciousness. Thus, Franz Fanon's chilling indictment, the racist in a culture with racism is normal. If we define culture as a set of meanings and values that inform the way we live, then racism has, in, has infiltrated, penetrated those meanings, shaping our ideas, attitudes, and dispositions directing our norms, rules, and expectations, guiding our linguistic, literary, artistic, media representation, re representations, and sociocultural practices. In short, we have generated and sustained a racist culture. Fanon's conclusion, then, does not exaggerate our condition. Consider the lives of black, Latinx women and men are at risk performing even during even simple encounters with the police. Indeed, <clears throat> dozens in the past, uh, well, more than dozens, well, dozens of our fellow citizens have died either directly at the hands of police or under suspicious circumstances while in police custody or during police tactical responses, dozens over the past, let's say, five years probably more like hundreds. Such behavior certainly must be denounced and condemned. And at the same time, we know that random and often fatal attacks against police officers are equally heinous, and those must be condemned. But consider the rate of incarceration in the United States. Since 2008, the rate of incarceration here has increased to the rate of 716 prisoners per 100,000 persons in the population. This has happened since 2008. And although we represent, I'm sure you know these statistics, everybody probably here has read the new Jim Crow. Um, if not, many of you, some of you at least, and some of you have seen 13th, the documentary on incarceration, or mass incarceration, or hyper-incarceration, if you prefer that term. Although we represent 5% of the world's population, we, uh, we, uh, it represents a 25%. We, Sorry, we imprison 25% of the world's incarcerated population. So one-fourth of the world's incarcerated population is here. Consider that we continue to live <clears throat> with the mocking, overheated, vicious rhetoric that lingers from the 2016 presidential campaign. 
we have even begun to normalize that rhetoric, continuing to polarize our interpersonal, familial, civic, even ecclesial relationships. Moreover, in the name of knee-jerk patriotism, some of us have deepened our divisions further by taking it upon ourselves to physically, even fatally, assault others whose views or dress or ethnicity or race or social standing differs from our own. Consider that we falsely accuse, malign, even defame as dangerous as threats. Murderers, rapists, thugs, children, women, and men who are Muslim, immigrants, not only from uh, the south of our country, but from other places as well. Jews, Sikhs, the economically impoverished. Consider the image of hundreds of young people, nearly all young white men, marching in the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, spewing anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant, and racist rhetoric. Consider that a young white man fatally shot nine black Christians as they prayed and studied the Bible in a Charleston, South Carolina church. Consider that after shouting ethnic slurs at two immigrant East Asian Indian men in a restaurant in Kansas, a middle-aged white man killed one of them, wounded the other, and fatally shot the young white man who came to their defense. Consider that after verbally threatening two young women, both African American, one in Muslim dress, who were riding a Portland, Oregon train, a middle-aged white man fatally stabbed the three white men who intervened to protest such behavior. Consider that our fractured national discourse about immigration may focus on our southern borders, but in the past, immigrants from Ireland, Italy, Poland were scapegoated. For the moment, no matter our identity, no matter our race or ethnocultural group, we scapegoat Latinx women and men who are only seeking to escape the violence of poverty, hunger, gangs, and corruption. <clears throat> on, on this prediction, we could say that tomorrow it will be other people with different skin tones fleeing similar injustices, and once again, we will insist that they threaten us. It's not about fixing our borders, more importantly about repairing our sense of how we are to receive those who enter our midst, how we understand who they are in relation to our own selves, our own being. Consider that although the current rate of overall employment has begun to decrease, the rate of unemployment among women, people of color continues to rise in comparison with that of whites. Yet work is of fundamental importance to the fulfillment of a human being. Salary disparities in relation to gender and race also persists. <clears throat> Excuse me. Economists maintain that nationally the gap in median annual pay for a woman and a man who hold a full-time year-round job is such that overall women in the United States are paid 80 cents for the dollar that is paid out to men amounting to an annual gender gap in wages of about $10,470. More importantly for our discussion, the wage cap, gap can be even larger for women of color. So how to speak about women of color in this context? And I'm not specifically doing that, but I am. <clears throat> Critical theorist and legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw drew attention to this sociological term of intersectionality in the late 1980s. She wanted to point up a way to refer to the interrogating of the relationships among multiple dimensions and modalities of social relationships and subject formations. So how are we formed? How's our subject subjectivity formed? This becomes a question for us. Intersectionality reminds us 
that every, individual's per, every individual person's identity consists of multiple intersecting factors, including gender, including race, including ethnicity, including class, including culture and sexuality. And even if that term has not achieved widespread usage, we cannot escape its challenge to attend to and listen to the multifaceted experiences of a human life. The more than 100 years of Catholic social teaching has not only been our best kept secret, it has been honored most in the breach when it comes to the concrete social conditions of people of color and women in particular. The U.S. Bishop's pastoral letter on racism, brothers and sisters to us, is small comfort coming 25 years after the civil rights movement, implying in its very title the relational marginalization of people of color. Black women and men in particular, but brothers and sisters to us, everybody wants to know who's the us. <laughs> who's the us? It's about subject positioning. Consider our historical treatment of women of color and I'll speak about black women in particular, under slaveocracy. Black women were sexually exploited and abused by male slaveholders through rape and forced concubinage. Handled as breeding stock, black women were considered promiscuous whores, unvirtuous, and hence by definition, unrapeable. Since black men were considered oversexed, who would rape white women if afforded the opportunity, white women were to be valued, cherished, and honored. Of course, the virtuousness of white women, those of a certain class to be sure, elevated them to the status of personal property in need of protection. Here is our 19th century Victorian cult of true womanhood. It's promo it promoted gentility, it corseted asexual morality, silence, and averting the eyes, uh, custody of the eyes. Yet these demure virtues belied the vicious cruelty of the female slaveholder, the lady of the plantation. Catholic teaching on sexuality then has fixed women in these terms as virgin mother or whore. <clears throat> That's a little simplistic, I understand that. There's plenty of gradations in between, but we, we're in a, a sort of, a, in a typology, we find ourselves more or less trapped this has become the situation of many Latinas. The pain of this rigidity is seen in the vulgar demeaning of black women on welfare, in the hypocritical male morality around prostitution. If we would take seriously the humanity of black, brown, red, yellow, differently abled queer trans women, we would be forced to grapple with our intentional avoidance of confrontation with our own racism, misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia, with our own deep and blinding enmeshment in bias. The most concise definition of racism is always prejudice plus power. Prejudice literally conveys prejudging, that is coming to judgment about something or someone prior to any experience, any questioning, any testing, any verification, any knowledge or encounter with. Prejudice then is rooted in ignorance. It may be corrected and it may be revised, but the refusal to accept correction to revise judgment, the refusal to revise judgment, the refusal to incorporate corrected information and new judgments into one's repertoire may be understood as bias. And by bias, I mean what the Jesuit philosopher and theologian Bernard Lonergan means by bias. That is the more or less conscious and deliberate choice to be incorrect to repress or to deny the surfacing of further questions or insights or information, the more or less deliberate refusal to think or act and live attentively, intelligently, rationally, and responsibly. All human beings are susceptible to bias as it distorts and inhibits our conscious activity and behavior in ordinary daily living by blinding or blocking our understanding, stunting our emotions or our affect, 
and damaging our achievement of community. Bias may occur in four principal ways. Dramatic bias, individual bias, group bias, and general bias. Dramatic bias disrupts healthy psychological, emotional, and affective development. It impairs the exercise of personal autonomy, and it debilitates effective behavior and action. Individual bias expresses itself in egoism, in selfish self-regard. And group bias expresses itself in selfish regard for and protection of the privileges and prerogatives that ensure the prominence and dominance of my particular group or social class or race or culture at the expense of other groups or social classes or races or cultures to deny their um, sorry, to deny their, to, to um, cling to my privileges and prerogatives, really at the expense of a common human good. The general bias of common sense refers to the smug sense of only competence that we experience because we presume to know all about all. We reject the knowledge of science or a technical specialization. We reject the knowledge of theory or philosophy. And this fourth bias plays a distinctive role in constricting and distorting insights for practical, intelligent, imaginative ordering and construction of the common human good, for healing and creating in society and in history. These all function, really, these biases, as alienations in our consciousness. Alienations in our empirical or experiencing consciousness, alienation in, alienations in our intellectual consciousness, alienations in our rational consciousness and in our responsible consciousness. We just refuse. We refuse. You just, uh, you can, we just have to think a little bit. There are plenty of examples uh, of, of these, this refusal all around us, all around us. Some of which, for some of which we ourselves are responsible. So let me say something about imagination. This, this has been, I think, for those of you who know Insight, you know it's a big book. He always says it's a little book. It's like 786 pages. This is my favorite <laughs> sentence. How indeed is a mind to become conscious of its own bias when that bias springs from a communal flight from understanding and is supported by the whole texture of a civilization? How do you get out of the water? That's what we all want to know. How do we get out of the water we are in? How can we change the water? Water's in us, this is my earlier point. It's already sedimented in our consciousness. I'm gonna talk about imagination a little bit. Imagination refers really to the mental capacity for experiencing, constructing, or arranging images, mental images. It's our capacity for experiencing and constructing those images. It's also, imagination is also regarded as responsible for fantasy, for inventiveness, for idiosyncratic behavior, for creative and original and insightful thoughts. And sometimes for a much wider range of activities. If we imagine the person who should be at the center of reimagining black liberation, human liberation, if we are to reimagine that, as Mr. Smith told me, black differently abled queer trans woman or black, brown, red, yellow, differently abled trans, queer trans women, if we are to imagine that, that person, as we know, is positioned marginally to our lives. To position this person at the center of our thinking requires intersectional thinking and requires a real leap of imagination. Our lives, yours and mine, assume a kind of transparency of space in which the socially produced landscape we inhabit is innocent. It's innocent. We cannot imagine the difficulties involved 
in navigating with ease and fluidity on the Boston College campus to be sure from one level to another. How, does, how, do, how do you get your wheelchair from lower campus to upper campus? Yeah, you, you, and you, you know, you've seen. Huh? We cannot imagine what it might mean to be frightened to come out, to speak our truths, to hold a partner's hand in public. We cannot imagine what it might mean to wake up to the feeling and knowledge, this is not my body. To be caught or trapped or enmeshed in a body that defies my mind and my heart, we cannot imagine. And we have to imagine. We must begin to imagine. If all human beings are to understand what liberation might mean. So we need to educate our imaginations. And doing that means to oppose bias and bigotry of all sorts in all forms. Where a biased imagination is inattentive and incurious and self-absorbed, an educated imagination is attentive, perceptive, and expansive. So I want to make this contrast between the biased imagination and the educated imagination. Where a biased imagination is obtuse and exclusionary, intentionally obtuse and intentionally exclusionary, an educated imagination is supple and strives for inclusivity. Where a biased imagination is furtive and self-centered and spiteful, an educated imagination is open and questioning, other-centered and generous. Where a biased imagination thrives on fear and despair, an educated imagination flourishes with and in trust and hope. Since I'm a theologian, I want to take my coordinates from the life and teaching of the Jewish Jesus of Nazareth. One of the most challenging teachings of Christianity is that in Jesus of Nazareth, we meet God in the flesh. God takes on our human stuff, our humanity, our matter, our hands, our eyes, our ears. Jesus spent his time on this earth engaging openly, lovingly, mercifully, compassionately with impoverished women and men and children, outcasts, untouchables, lepers, Children, women, and men deprived of sight, twisted and palsied in their limbs, broken in heart and spirit. To reimagine human liberation is to take up the cause then for justice wherever we find injustice, to speak truth wherever we, we hear a lie, to stand our ground wherever truth is threatened. So let me, let me make a, a couple of points and then, then we can maybe really have a, a conversation and can learn some things here. <clears throat> First, if we want to resist the cultural imperialism and the powerful racism that shapes our daily living, we have to take race and racism seriously. It means admitting that there's just one race, the human race, but it also means admitting that we've constructed our epidermis to mean something. It really means nothing but we've constructed it so. We have to resist the temptation to reduce race to an irrelevant category and of racism to personal prejudices of individuals. It means that we have to uncover and expose our racialized history with its racist exclusions and brutalities concealed beneath so many self-promoting master narratives. <clears throat> We need to promote then, secondly, a deeper understanding of the human person as person. Not as a statistic, the result of calculating participation on a form or a questionnaire. Not as a specialist involved in some particular work, but a human person as I am a human person. Certainly, <clears throat> in the kind of historical and social matrix dominated by racism, racism that we are living in, Genuine openness to others, to strangers and to different cultures is never easy. We're overcoming something in ourselves. It's really our attempt to get out of the water, to get out of what holds us back. 
But we cannot be superficial about others, their cultures, and their differences. Nor can we retreat from the challenges of engaging other and different cultures or people simply because such engagement is difficult and fraught with so many negative possibilities. This is about risk. So we have to risk not only engagement, but change of mind and heart and behavior, affective conversion, if you like, for resisting racism to bring about a change in us, a change in our own attentiveness, in our own questions, in our own reflection, in our own judgments, in our own choices, in our own living, in our own loving. <clears throat> Fourth, <clears throat> there's always the question of what do we do about historic injustices? No one in this room was involved in the slave trade. Any one of us, so Ancestry.com tells us, might have had ancestors on either side of the slave-slaveholder divide. But none of us in this room were involved. None of us are guilty of those wrongs. Iris Marion Young proposes in response to a, uh, an application of guilt, she proposes what she calls a social connection model with regard to historic injustices finding ways not to re-inscribe old thinking on our new encounters and relationships, but understanding that we must live differently into the future. Sadia Hartman writes uh, that I live now, she writes, I live now in the future. I live now in the time of slavery, the, time of the, the future that slavery created. And, and this, is, this is also a significant, really, insight for us. Whatever we have now comes from what we had in the 19th century. This is the groundwork for our lives here. The 18th century, the 17th century. So start to talk about manifest destiny. Start to talk about the Mexican and American War. Start to talk about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Start to talk about our refusal to leave Mexico's land alone, but rather to wake up and seize it. So that social connection model is a response to historic injustice. It means really that we have to learn how to encounter one another and to live differently with one another. And then finally, <clears throat> if we really want to promote the human flourishing that Catholic social teaching encourages, then we have to become instances of incarnate moral and ethical choice in a world under the influence of the reign of sin. To promote human flourishing, then, will emphasize and engage our essential humanness. Our resistance to racism must be rooted not in the arrogance of triumph over evil, but in love of human persons. That love must acknowledge and witness to the oneness of human creatures, all human creatures, and honor the ri richness of human diversity as a most basic feature of our human unity, at the same time situating us all within the beauty of the order of God's creation. I'm going to stop here and hope that we can have a real conversation. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm scared of most people here, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm scared of most people here, but it's okay. <laughs> Tim, go ahead. Mm.
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. No, I think that's I think that's true and to some extent. That's a really good question. That's a really good question. And sometimes I would say for myself at least, and other people in here can respond to this, um, and I hope they do. Sometimes the more intentional you are, it just doesn't work. I mean, there's a way in which you, there has to be serious intentionality. What, what can I do? Um, how can I help them make the connections without making the connections for them? Because then they're not then they're not doing it, I'm doing it, and that's just one more thing somebody's telling me. <clears throat> I was fortunate, I have been fortunate enough to teach in the Pulse program. And that service learning program, which has the benefit of giving students, um, being a part of a, of a core requirement uh, for theology and philosophy, um, they always come thinking we'll get out of theology if we go to Pulse. We won't have to do any theology. <clears throat> and and they're, they're mightily mistaken in the end. You know. um, but I think um, this sort of throws them. And, and it doesn't happen to everybody. It doesn't happen to everybody because we've made volunteerism <clears throat> really something that students put on their resumes. And I'm not, I'm not sort of painting everybody in that way because that's not true. But, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's deeper and deeper. You're, you start here at the college level, but then you find out that down there in high school, there, there are people who are doing this, and they're getting more and more service opportunities. And then, then in the grade school, we're doing this. And, and that's good, because we're trying to cultivate a sense of commitment to others, um, a sense of responsibility to, not for, but to others. That's the alongsideness of solidarity. And that's the alongsideness of solidarity. I'm not doing it for you because as soon as I start that, I'm off into a kind of top-down, you know, I've got it and you don't and I'm going to dish it out. Some students really have powerful uh, conversions. They respond to meeting new people that they've never known. And, and some parents are not happy that they've met new people they haven't known. But, but young people, I mean, I, I admire them in, in their, their elasticity and in their, their vibrance, vi vibrancy and in their, uh, their capacity to real, that really constrict, that's elasticity, yeah, really, you know. And they really want to think, some of them, you know. We, you know, this, this is, well, this is, they're a reflection of us. <laughs> they're a reflection of us. We don't want to work too hard. So if somebody will just tell me what I should believe and do, that's great. But, but there are, I think, increasing numbers of young people for whom that's, that's not the case. So research projects can become um, important tools, learning about the problem that you're going to help. Um, you, some of you probably have already read this. Nancy Remen, who's a physician, has an incredible article that you can Google on Google, um, that uh, it's called, uh, it, it's about helping is not fixing. You know. So you don't, they're not there to fix, they're there to help. That's the alongsideness of solidarity. So the student who says to me, well, I'm going to go on Thanksgiving break, who will make sure this little kid's hair is combed and, you know, the kid's six years old now, you know, she survived her parents for six years, survived them for the weekend. But sort of starting to figure that out, that I'm bringing something to be, to befriend, to accompany, that's really, uh, that, that's important. Or to learn, learn our students need to, I can't quite get the geography appropriate, but I realize I'm not in the city of Philadelphia. But um, our students have to learn to take public transportation. 
they're quite isolated from, from the going ons of things. You have some, you have a train here, I learned, you can hop in and go down, go down. They have to learn how to do that and learn how, because they're suburban kids. They don't take walks, they jog. Huh? So that means you're not strolling on the sidewalk. This is our, our little conversation today. I mean, they're not, they're not doing that. And, and I think um, I had to learn that about them because I was annoyed that they were always complaining about having to be on public. I said, get on the, what, what, so what? But then I started to think, wait a minute, your parents have been driving you around for the last six years from this to this to this to this because there is no public transportation in the suburbs. Or if there is, what it is, it's the commuter train into uh, wherever. So, so I think that's where, that's where there's a learning, you know, sort of engagement as well, you know. And I think also, you know, read grown-up stuff, <laughs> you know. I mean, we've, we've all decided that Plato and Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas are not for, uh, you know, are, these are not namby-pamby readings, but we make them read them. There's other grown-up stuff they can read. And if they throw the book across the room, that's okay. They go up and pick it up because they're going to get a reading quiz the next day. huh? <laughs> it's a survival strategy. But at the end of the semester, if, you, if somebody can say, I really didn't like that. I didn't like the critique. But I tried to stay with it and listen. And I could get some insight. Then, then that's worth it for everybody in that room. Because they, our students still learn a good deal from one another. I mean, I'm sure somebody else must have some strategies. Jerry or Professor Doug Debo back there. Yes. Had it not been yes. for that financial gain and the fact that they could yeah. every door to town university to them and they had yeah. much more of that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. I mean, I think um, from what I know about it, from what I know about it, I think that they're okay, they're they're really trying. They're not just changing the name of a building. I mean, okay, so there is Healy Hall. But but that's not that's not their main focus. It's to provide some form of um, access to education in a really uh, substantial way for descendants of these people. And that's really, that's important because we're talking about um, the whole issue of generational social capital. So, so here are people who had no opportunity to acquire cultural social capital in, in the sense of the currency of, of the book, the currency of that. And, and just to um, appreciate uh, whether or not they left Georgetown reading or not. I mean, this is the other point about, about Catholics. You have a, we have a catechism in the 19th century. <clears throat> um, England wrote one for people in South Carolina, Bishop England. But, um, did they have any access once they were sold? And we know what happens to people once, once they try to read and write. We've got examples of that. If we don't, there are plenty of things for us to find out in the Smithsonian. Um, the Smithsonian still produces a, um, a collection on slavery, um, which are some of the rec recordings of voices of, uh, of freed uh, enslaved people um, recorded during the time that they were doing the WPA, Works Project Administration, interviews under um, 
Roosevelt. He sent these people all out, ethnographers, cultural workers, uh, writers. Zora Neale Hurston was a part of that. Um, they went out and interviewed people. And, uh, and, and they, some of them were recorded, not all. So you can, I, I, played, a, I played a little segment in, in my class last week, you know. I mean, just, this, you know, these were real people. And so I think that's part of what Georgetown is doing. It's reminding us there were real human beings, not some abstract concept, which is, of course, what happens. This is, this is the point that all the decolonial thinkers are trying to get us to remember. You know, Dussel started this long ago, but Manolo repeats it. You know, it's the commodification. The only people in history turned into commodities, into merchandise. The Indians are displaced. The indigenous people are displaced. They have to recompose, rethink their lives because they're so tied into place and land, so they can't get access to places. But they have to sort of recompose all that. But, but here we have people who are, are simply merchandise. You know, line items in a ledger. So, so to, to confront that, I think, is, is really important. So I, try, I, I, want, I want them to, to somehow, whatever succeed means, it, and it's not about, it, this is the point about social uh, connection. It's not about breastfeeding, oh, I did this, I did this. Okay, what are you going to do in the future? And it's not as if everyone, even in that period, and we all know this, agreed about slavery. We all know there were abolitionists. We all, I'm in Philadelphia. Huh? Oh, no, I'm not in Villanova. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to be in Philadelphia. <laughs> but, but, I mean, here we are. Just think, you're right, we're right down the road. And, and think about, about the juxtaposition, you know, really, of this, of the cry for liberty, and then we're dragging people out of the church, here we wind up with Mother Bethel. I mean, there's that, then, then it's like real human beings, just like me. My humanity is your humanity is, in that way, I'm not talking about how we shape or form our own subjectivity, but the stuff of it is the same. Some of us do, do better with it than others, just across the board. But, but it's not, there's like a black human nature and a, you know, uh, an Asian human nature and a, you know, we, we get shaped, our nature gets shaped by culture, by, you know. And Jesus shows us, if you, if, if you, if you want to go biblical, okay, Jesus shows us we can change. Huh? It's a Syrophoenician woman. Here he is, he's not doing it, and she's right back at him, you know, and, 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 and he's thinking. He must be thinking. You know. So, so that, that's what I think. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, because you're... you're uh... Well, I think that um, when I think about what they've gone through at Georgetown and what's locked at Georgetown and so on, I, just, um, I can't help but imagine that it helps all of us who are connected to the church to know that she, she's gone through that. Mm -hmm. But if, if you can see very clearly, my institution, the one I have as a Jewish would not exist for a very candid and, and undeniable. So I think it, it connects with, I think, all of our institutions in the way thinking and, and I think that what now we're going to do. Yeah, it's forward looking responsibility. That's what, that's what we have to do. So if I treat you badly, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know about your campus. Our campus, sadly, you know, much to my weeping, we had some very sad incidents in the fall. And, and I'm thinking, you know, this, this is 300 years ago. Why are you using these words, these terms? If you keep reinscribing this in the present, then you're, you're, you're constantly flipping us all back there. And then we all start behaving like people behaved back there. So, so well, how do I go forward? How do I say, okay, this is a, th this was in the past. Okay, there's a, there's a, there is real responsibility in the present, you know, because none of us built this building, but we're all enjoying it, and every student 
will come in here will enjoy it too. Every new faculty member will come in here and enjoy it. We don't, we, I, I, I say always, we don't repave the roads every, we, we don't make the road to Boston College. You know, you, it's there. Something is here. And it's here because of someone else's sacrifice. So how do I participate in honoring that by how I behave, how I live? So, so having some sort of understanding that the past and the present are connected, it's confronting what's painful and what makes us unhappy. That's for darn sure. And, and the thing that's so stunning for, for people in my generation is that when people come, came to discover this, I mean, it's, nobody wanted to talk about slavery because people made them feel, you must have done something to do that. You must be. So the blame is, this is, here we are blaming the victim again. I mean, it's really, so, so there's a way that people are quiet until someone kind of, you know, brings them out. But, but. Why do we do that? You know, why do, we, why do kids put on neo-Nazi costumes? I mean, seriously, I mean, it's, it's, we don't teach our history in such a way that people understand the ways in which people can be harmed by other people's actions. And harmed not just on an occasion, but deeply uh, psychologically traumatized. Um, there's a, an article by a woman whose name is Janice Gump. Um, who's, who writes in psychoanalytic psychology. And uh, she's writing on um, African-American subjectivity as shaped even in the 20th century by slavery. So the residue of all this stuff is still with us. It's still with us. And we can only, we can only face, we have to face up to it. That's the point, you know. That's the point. Well, I think, I think this is it. I think, I think, how am I responsible? So how am I responsible to the past? Um, nobody's going to get any reparations. I mean, this is, just forget that. You know, that's not going to happen. But at the same time, um, let's, let's think about, there's, I'm going to forget the author's name. There's a great book. It's not about um, the U.S. It's about Latin America, the color of citizenship. This impacted us in the Second World War, huh? So who got interned and who didn't? Because we fear them, not them. We can handle them. But we're afraid of these people. They're, so, so there's a, there's a, to be responsible means I have to engage my history. I mean, that's the first thing people have to do. I mean, you can use whatever terms that are, that are functional and operative for you that work. If you want to talk about racial privilege, okay, that's fine. A student in my class the other day said, you know, well, we're, we're talking about this. We're making connections with uh, what we have been reading and these other uh, more theoretical readings and the films we had seen. And um, being white isn't, isn't just about skin color. In as much as, she said, well, we can pass, those of us who are white passing. So I said to her, I love that term, white passing. So you're respectable enough. This is where, where young people today are critiquing, people in Black Lives Matter, are critiquing for us the politics of respectability. What has it gotten them? Nothing. I mean, that's the other, that's the other or at least very little. That's the, that's the point of, um, People, I mean, these are, these are ancient people for, for the kids today, like Tupac Shakur. That's, the, that's a burden of some of that. It's a burden of arrested development. I mean, that, that, that's what people were trying to communicate very, very sincerely and to do it in your face so you would pay attention. But we didn't pay attention because that's not how you should act. And so, so you go into the politics of respectability. And so once you do that, then... You, 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 we ourselves can be capitulated or, or co-opted in that process. That's where the issue of self-examination is always important. I mean, 
the, the point of, of this, the little Lonergan aside, genuine objectivity is the fruit of genuine subjectivity. If I can identify my biases, then I can learn how to operate in such a way that I really am approaching and dealing with what, what is the case. Not what I want to be the case, but what is the case. So yes, trying to figure that out. They took a long time to try to figure it out. They just didn't wake up and say, okay, let's go find people. They had a consultation, which meant everybody was getting educated. They were learning something. They were being shocked, angry, sad. So they didn't repress their emotions. They let them out. And that, that's, part of, that's part of the growth. It's really part of the growth. It's part of the, the, uh, the, the asceticism of it. Part of the asceticism of it. So, so learning how to, I mean, we, you know, in some ways, 50 years ago is, is today. The, the concerns of Martin Luther King 50 years ago are the concerns that we have today. War, militarism, poverty, racism. These are, these are still, here they are. And, and he's talking about a world house. He's not just talking about the US. He sees the interconnections. So, so Georgetown, I mean, the United States isn't the only place that has slavery, but because it's, it's sort of like, it, it, because we've made ourselves into a model, and because there are very many good things here, then we have to take responsibility for how is it that only some people have access to those good things and not others. And do I understand that my liberty, my freedom, my agency comes at the price of another? How can I figure out how not to make my insistence on my individuality, my freedom, my liberty, do I have to sell you to get it? Whether it's, it's certainly not, not in that, that literal sense, but we do it in other ways. We do it in other ways, so we prevent some states from doing some things and not others so that we can have what we need. If you, if you, if you look at um, thinking about, uh, think about Puerto Rico. <laughs> think about Puerto Rico. New Orleans is barely back, you know. So, so I mean, think about that and think about um, you know, what you can learn from watching uh, Spike Lee's documentary, there are people saying, you know, the things that happen to people, to Louisiana as a state because of the oil production are not things that happen to some other states. Some other money that could be used for education could be used for some. But we're, we're satisfied to sort of, you know, they're just poor benighted people. So, so there's a, here's where I think that model of, of kind of getting a community to come together to work on this um, and, and to take their time doing it. I mean, because you want to rush in. You want to fix. And that's not being, cause solidarity takes a long time. Authentic solidarity doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot of testing involved. How truthful will you be? Vincent, Vincent was jumping around here. Well, thank you so much uh, for the talk. I really appreciated the, the account of racism that's uh, looking deep uh, within the system, the pervasiveness, uh, how it's sort of in our consciousness, and, and you know, uh, telling the story of the, you know, the Black African specific as well as urban groups. I wanted to just uh, say a bit about the, the theological ethical method that uh, you're using. I, I, you begin with the CSP and then apply it to the, the, the case of uh, racism. Uh, Sure, I mean, when you think about Rerum Navarum, you know, uh, Leo the Thirteenth, 
the impetus also comes from U.S. bishops here because we're going through the industrial, everybody's going through the industrial revolution. But there's some, there's some, Gibbons is pushing around here. Cardinal Gibbons, he's pushing. Okay. Yeah, these people are, uh, they're, they're, they're seeing what's happening and, and here, here maybe is a, maybe, I don't want to make a, a bad leap, but I'm, I'm thinking you're, you're, you're coming out of, you're just, you're 30 years out of um, emancipation as a legal means, but we all know that that just flipped back uh, by 1877, it was all over. I mean, so here you are, there's competition for work and there's abuse of workers and you still have immigrants moving heavily into the US. And so what, what you have are bishops being concerned about what's happening, I'm sure, to their countrymen. And, and not to fault that, but the thing is that what happens to one human happens to us all. That, that's the insight that I wish that Catholic social teaching could exploit more vigorously. That, well, I, I want it to be there anyway. You know, I mean, if you say that we're that there's human dignity in life, and that and that that um, we are all made in the image and likeness of God, but but that can be an easy formula for us sometimes, and and not really a concrete reality, and and that's that's my that's my push on it. I think that's right, and I think that. Um, I mean, you, you know, okay, Lonergan reframes this a little bit as the, as the human good. I always say the common human good because nobody knows what the human good is when you're talking about it. But, but what he's talking about really is um, interlocking systems of order that are governed by values and the values are expressed in human relationships. I mean, that, that's really what we're, what we're about. But we don't, it, all of this takes so much time. And Americans are pragmatic people. If it's not fast, we don't want it. And I, I, think, I think the thing about the Catholic Church as slow, and it is slow, the good thing about that is being demonstrated by something like Georgetown, that you're taking your time, you're doing your research, you're paying attention, you're bringing in alumni, you're bringing in this. And when you're ready to understand what you're doing, then you go and really look for, for uh, descendants because you don't want to expose people to more pain. And, and that's what would happen unless you're prepared. So you have to be prepared to not have everybody love you, not be, be prepared that, that, okay, maybe over time something will happen, but I'm gonna keep, um, that's solidarity sticking with it. That's solidarity sticking with it. So there's a spiritual exercise attached to this. I'm not talking about the Jesuit spiritual exercises, but there's a spiritual, uh, exercise, asceticism that's attached to this in some ways that, that, that warrants, and you're writing about hope, you know, I mean, I'm still trying to understand that article, you know, <laughs> but, but, but there's something that's really there for us. I, I'm not trying to throw it out, but I think it, we, it, it, it can't just be, you know, a concept that we, okay, we produce the document. It's sort of like the economic pastoral was really thick. It was real thick here in the U.S. because people actually looked at the bishops and told them their story. Those, they, they held hearings all around the country and, and people told them their and There was a texture here. See, that was a very rich set of ideas. Yes. Of the yes. It does have a potential to come through. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. How, how do police explain yes. the yes. killing unarmed people? People, yes. Yeah. And uh, we live in a culture that has been grappled with not just killing unarmed folk, but masculinized so that the dominant voice yes. is male and white. Yes, and yes. I hear many people saying there's silence that's needed even at Villanova University because the white male takes up all the oxygen in the room. Yeah. yeah. And it's constant. Yeah. Separate the two in some ways. 
Well, I, I think I think that this is this is where, you know, some people have to begin to speak that out and back to people. I mean, Alex McCulloch was here, and he's a perfect example of somebody who's really trying hard to do that. And um, because of that, he's lost jobs. You know, denied tenure. Denied, he's paid a real price for that, a real price. And he won't talk. He doesn't talk about it, but he's paid a price for it. So he's, you know, or you had a, a country, you know, led by an erudite, graceful black man, but my God, you know, we went off the rail. You know. He's not perfect. He wasn't perfect, but but we went off. That's off the rail, and we we make no response. Not you know. Wow. When when uh, well okay when yeah let me stop. <laughs> Because, you know, it, it's sort of sad. I don't know why I keep expecting more of the bishops. I, I just keep expecting more. I don't know why, you know. <laughs> okay, are you a student? I'm a student. Yay. <laughs> It, it is, and, and I think, first of all, we have to learn how to think in the plural, mm -hmm. not simply one person, mm -hmm. not simply one person. I also think that when this student who, who is male said to me that we need to put a person who's really isolated at the center of trying to talk about human flourishing, wow. That means you take the most vulnerable person and you learn what their needs are. And if you can do that, then we can take care of all the rest of us who don't have maybe all of those concerns. I think, I don't know about ideal. You know, I don't know about ideal. But I do know it should never be one person. This is part of our problem. This is the crisis. We keep looking for a leader. We're always all, everybody's looking for a leader, you know. And if the leader doesn't come in the form in which you think he or she should come, and it's usually he, then, then you feel leaderless and nothing, nothing is happening. So, so someone, you know, so, 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 so trying to teach us advanced democracy, you know, looked like there was no leadership. But we just didn't want to cooperate. We just didn't want to cooperate. We wanted things our way. And saying our way fails fails us tremendously because we're failing ourselves. Because I'm not thinking about the most vulnerable people in my community. I'm not thinking about elders. I'm not thinking about people who are mentally um, you know, challenged or who are so wounded in their subjectivity that, that they, they literally lose their minds. I mean, you know, how could someone stab their children and have them in a, in a house for a couple days and then, that, that's not normal. But you've made this person abnormal by the way we've treated them. Or the little, these are two black kids in, in our area this happened to. Or think of the, the two, the, the little white girl who washes up on the beach. Nobody knew who she was for, for almost a year until her mother finally was so guilted out inside that she came forward. I mean, there's just, something's wrong with, with us if this is what people are driven to because they feel they have no resources. They allow themselves to be abused or they found themselves, again, so wounded in their subjectivity, they think that the world is a danger to their children. And it is. And it is. So I think, I think there's a... Um, there has to be, we have to build more leadership capacity, capacity among young people. And I think Black Lives, Matters, Black Lives Matter, as I understand it, is doing some of that by being both, by being very creative. Not, not, not sort of getting your orders from on high. But, but trying to figure out how to be honest in, you know, moving around in your own locale. I think that's also a, a this, we talk about civic engagement. That's civic engagement. 
That's civic engagement. That's people being engaged for the good of society, for the good of the civic whole. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 you know, no more Martin Luther King Jr.'s. I mean, no more Fannie Lou Hamer's. No more Rosa Parks. No more Septima Clark. You know? That, that's, that's not in our future, I think. But I think the collaborations of young people, one of the good things about young people is that bl when Black Lives Matter, Matter is marching, there are all sorts of people there. It's not just only black people. It took the, the Civil Rights Movement wasn't integrated for the longest time. We are running now Catholics, showing the five nuns on the television, you know. And I'm not mocking, because that took a lot of courage. And people from Manhattan, uh, Col Manhattan College of the Sacred, Manhattanville College of the Sacred Heart flew down and marched. I mean, all sorts of people did that under the guise of just being human beings and citizens. But we want to show off how we were there. We weren't. We were the tail lights. We weren't the headlamps. This is, this is Jerome Ledoux's conclusion. The church is the tail light. We, we're, as Lonergan says, we always arrive a little breathless and a little late. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And then once we get there, look at us. Look what, we, look what we're doing. So, so the thing is that, is that this is your point about, about, about patriarchal leadership, which can be also carried out by women. Yeah. So that they are the yes, you're right. But you're very right. You're very right. And, uh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Well, we thought they were wishing they had gone. <laughs> yeah, we're all right. We're all struggling. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. For coming back from sabbatical or you know like coming out on Wednesday when you don't teach or <laughs>